Lee. And first of all, welcome to the audience. Great to see it uh, bursting at the seams, this hall. And of course, welcome to our panel. And you could not get a higher caliber of podium to talk about these issues. Uh, right Honourable Liz Truss MP, Right Honourable Ben Davey, Caroline Lucas MP, and of course the Right Honourable Caroline Flint. Welcome to you all, and thank you very much for putting aside the time to come and debate these critical issues. I'd like to ask uh, Michelle Thomas to uh, stand up and uh, ask her question. What do you believe is the most critical environmental issue that you will need to focus on if you get into power? What's the top priority? It is climate change, because the science is, uh, is absolutely clear. We've got to run at this. It's really pressing and urgent. And tackling climate change tackles so many environmental issues, whether it's our species, uh, the oceans. All aspects of the environment are being affected by climate change, so it's got to be urgent. And with Paris in December, we have to run at this. How will you guarantee that the UK's target of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases, uh, gas emissions by 2050 is met, will be met? Well, first of all, we're absolutely committed to this target. It is vitally important that we do address climate change and we show global leadership on it. I think the, the difference in approach of our party and maybe some of the other parties represented on this stage is that we want to give producers, consumers the freedom to innovate in different ways that we can see carbon reduced over time. And that's why we prefer a more general target, putting a price on carbon essentially, so that we can see the innovation take place. Just one thing uh, to you, Caroline Flint. How compatible is your price freeze promise with getting more renewable energy, given that, like it or not, at the moment, renewable energy costs more than the average market price? Well, I don't think the uh, I don't think the price freeze has anything to do with that. I'm not just saying that. And well, a lot of renewable energy well, organisations were very worried what, when you came what, out with that announcement. What, renew, what renewable energy organisations say to me and those who want to invest is that they want clarity about the certainty of the direction of travel. That is why the decarb target was so important for renewable organisations and companies like Siemens because it gave that sense of where we needed to get to. That is vitally important. We've already given Caroline. Uh, the certainty and stability to investors through, first of all, ensuring that the fourth carbon budget was not revised, as the Chancellor wanted to. I fought him off on that. The fourth carbon budget was not revised. Moreover, we got the 2030 package in Europe, which is actually far more powerful for investors than a UK-only power sector decarbonisation target, because it sets the framework for investment in renewables across the whole of Europe, which is a, a bigger market, by the way, than the UK. So we do that. We'd have a power sector decarbonisation target in that Zero Carbon Britain bill. We'd give the Green Investment Bank more uh, powers, just like Caroline said, but actually we're going to go further than Labour on that. And we would also uh, legislate to uh, end uh, unabated use of coal and power uh, generation by 2050. 20, tw sorry, 2025. Just How very do you quick, explain Caroline? that um, in 2014, the investment in renewables is only at the rate it was in 29, and it fell in 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. You're just oh, completely Bloomberg wrong. It's Bloomberg Energy Finance no, Group that say uh, that. Caroline, not me. Okay, I will, Caroline, I'll tell you what, I will let, let everyone very here quickly, yeah, read please. the uh, low carbon. Uh, investment report we're publishing tomorrow. It sets out all the details and shows that the figures that Caroline and Labour have been using this are completely false. Okay, a question on airports uh, from James Lees. Um, how will any future UK airports and aviation policy be compatible with the party's environmental ambitions? Thank you very much. Um, Caroline Lucas, what would you do about our airports? Um, uh, the question is very well made because, frankly, I think it is simply incompatible um, to think that we can meet our climate change objectives and go on expanding aviation indefinitely in this country, which appears to be the uh, policy of, of the other parties. Um, sadly, we haven't come up with a, a, a way of replacing aviation um, fuel with anything better yet. And so until we do, then I think we have to be very clear that it's not a question of whether we should be expanding Heathrow or Gatwick. It's a question of saying we are not going to be expanding either of them. Would you like us to fly less? I, I mean, I, I mean I, I, when you say like, I mean, I, I well, understand, well, I appreciate why party, flying is, like a, is, fly a, is a wonderful thing to do, but I think we need to fly less. Yes, I think we do. So um, mm. uh, I think that, you know, when you see um, people who are regularly flying, I mean, I, I'm not saying that you know, everyone has their one um, holiday, for example. Sorry? How many times have you flown in the last two, five I haven't. years? 
please, who has a question about related to the EU. Thank you. Um, what implications would there be for UK environmental policy and clean tech investment in the, inv in the event it were to exit from the EU? I think there'd be enormous uh, impact on clean tech investment. I think there'd be enormous impact on investment across the board. And, uh, and I cannot think of anything worse uh, than having a situation after the election on May the 7th of two years of internal wrangling over us having an exit strategy for the EU. Look, um, I'm not saying that we're going to ever make everybody in Britain love the EU as an institution, but there's a lot of homegrown institutions that people don't love either. It would be disaster for environmental policy and for investment in clean tech, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and I want to paint a nightmare scenario. Um, there's a conservative majority or minority government. <laughs> That's a pretty disaster. But, but, but for the environment in Europe, because just as we are preparing for uh, the Paris negotiations on climate change, the most important climate negotiations ever, with Britain up to now leading the way in Europe and uh, really pushing the European agenda, the, e the UK minister at the EU Council, let's remember we negotiate at the UN as an EU, would not be listened to because they would currently then, at that stage, be negotiating, changing the, uh, our uh, um, views of membership, uh, putting through the House of Commons a bill for a referendum. Do you think that's going to impress the rest of our European colleagues? Do you think our voice will be heard in those circumstances? It's a total disaster, a recipe for Britain's voice on climate change being completely muted and ignored. And given that Europe has actually played such an important role, I love telling my uh, Conservative colleagues that EU product standards have ha had the biggest impact on energy efficiency in this country. It's my favourite line to Conservative colleagues. If elected, how would your party work to tackle the problem of overfishing in the seas across the globe? Uh, Liz Truss, what would you do about the fish in the sea? <laughs> so, first of all, I think we've made massive progress this Parliament with reform of the common fisheries policy. It was led by Richard Bennion. He did a fantastic job, first of all, in achieving the discard ban, which was put in place this January, which means we're no longer throwing healthy fish uh, back into the sea, and also giving more um, powers for member states over specific quotas in their areas of the water. But I think there is still more we need to do uh, on various f fish types, and it's certainly a priority for us. We put in place marine conservation zones. But not very many of them, in fact, not, not we put in nearly place, as many as were We put in desired. place 27, and we've just launched 23, um, consultation on 23 more. Uh, we obviously need to do it on the best available evidence. And one of the things I'm keen to do is see those zones linked in a blue corridor, in a marine corridor, so we can actually link those areas in the way that we have done landscape scale natural protection on land. I'd like to see seascape scale protection as well. The Pitcairn Islands, I think, is a major step forward. I would say we've made much better progress on the common fisheries policy than we have on the common agricultural policy, where I'd like to see more reform, but there is certainly more to do. Um, is NIMBYism a force for good or ill? Caroline Lucas. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's important and valuable to protect what you love. And I think sometimes the um, term NIMBY is, 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 is not used very fairly. Um, what I think is not good is when you're just trying to get it out of your backyard and you don't much care where it goes after that. What I think has been so impressive, for example, around the um, campaign against fracking is the way in which people are not saying, uh, don't frack here, go and frack somewhere else. They're actually saying, we don't want fracking and we will go to wherever fracking is happening and we will join up together, collaboratively, really? and work together. Really? Did the people together. from Surrey go up to Lancashire Absolutely. and Absolutely. The people in Bolcombe, with there. whom I spent quite a lot of time, uh, <laughs> but, but, but from all over the place, where other places, indeed, people coming down from the north of the country where they had had some fracking there already. It's the same with some of the campaigns about aviation expansion. Again, a really good model where people from Heathrow have been in solidarity with people in Gatwick and other places to say, we want no further growth in aviation. And so I think, you know, if, you, if, if by nimbyism we're simply saying, go and put it somewhere else, I think that's negative. If it's saying we protect what we love and we'll also support others to protect what they love, then I think it could be a very positive force for good. Another way forward is actually to, tr to create imbiism, trying to create incentives for people to actually want to have uh, things in their area. And the way you do that is by showing that there is something in it for them. 
If we look at history, if we look at the brutalist architecture of the 60s and 70s that went up in spite of the way people lived and the way people lived their lives, it was a massive disaster that broke up communities. And I think it's wrong for central government to go around and imposing particular types of structures or, or built environments on local communities that don't support them. I think we all want to see low carbon technologies. We all want to see um, a mix of energy supply. There are the right places, in my view, to have solar energy and wind, en wind energy created. I also support nuclear. I support a mix of energies. But we do need to give local people the say over those technologies. But not when it comes to fracking under their homes. Uh, I was going to come on to that in a second. Uh, just hang on a minute, no, David. Sorry. Uh, my, in my We're going to come on to my fracking in a minute. Day in office, I received Please, Joe, a we'll letter from, a a from 100 yeah. MPs, almost all Conservative, a few Labour, telling me to stop onshore wind. I ignored them. Uh, and I've had to fight day in, day out, particularly with Mr Pickles, to make sure that onshore wind investment wasn't completely curtailed. Uh, we have been successful, we would have been even more successful if it wasn't from some of the opposition from our coalition partners. What is going to happen to DEFRA's funding in the next government? If, uh, I'll start with Liz, if, if the Conservatives get into power. So over the course of this parliament, DEFRA has seen a reduction in the budget. Uh, you know, that's how about, I want to know about the future. How about it going to be in the future? I, I, I want to tell you the approach of this parliament and what we'd adopt in the next parliament. But nevertheless, despite that, we've managed to protect frontline services. I want to know what's going to happen if you get elected in the next five years. Well, I, we will move in the same direction. We will continue to make efficiencies within the organisation <laughs> and we will protect frontline services. So continued efficiencies means greater cuts, yeah? Well, we will make... We will make our organisations work. Thank you, Carolyn Flynn. What would happen to DEFRA under Labour? Well, um, across um, Whitehall, apart from the protective areas, we've identified there will have to be departmental cuts year on year. And, you know, just be upfront with you about that. A question about housing. <clears throat> Given that the UK has one of the most inefficient housing stocks in the EU, what more will each party commit to do in order to improve energy performance and lift people out of fuel poverty? Well, first of all, we're going to completely revamp uh, the ecosystem as soon as we can when it ends in 2017. We're going to take the same amount of money we have at the moment that comes from the energy companies, and instead of a top-down approach, we're going to actually have it delivered from the communities bottom up. We think that that model for local area schemes with local authorities and other involved is the best way to deliver, but also to create jobs, but also deal with some of the anomalies in the system where a family in, for example, many streets in Doncaster, Victorian terraces, someone's an owner occupier or in the private rented sector and they can't get advantage of the eco scheme. We're also going to set a bigger standard for the private rented sector to reach C by 2027. And I have to say, and I said this when I was shadowing the communities and local government brief, given 40% of housing benefit goes into the private rented sector. I think we should expect more for those people living in those properties. And we can't just expect the tenants to ask for it because it's not fair on them when they're up against the landlord. Have you written to your pension um, funds to ask them to diverse from fossil fuels? Carlo you. Lucas. <laughs> well, I have got a campaign in Parliament trying to get the Parliamentary Pension Fund to divest, and they won't even tell us where they are investing. And by the law of averages, they will have some investments in fossil fuels, in, uh, undoubtedly. But the fight that we're having to get them to, um, to, to take that seriously and lead by example, you know, this would be a wonderful story that if the Parliamentary Pension Scheme would divest, how wonderful would that be alongside the churches and other leaders of society? It would be amazing, but they haven't done it yet. But let me just have 10 seconds because I I cannot sit here and hear what Ed Davies said about this government's record on energy efficiency. I'm the co-president of the all-party group on energy efficiency and fuel poverty. And under this government, there has been an 80% drop in insulation measures provided for the fuel poor. We've seen the end of CERT, the end of CESP, the end of Warm Front. The Green Deal has been a disaster. Eco actually pushes more people into poverty because of the way it's funded by putting a levy. That by put it's your own DEX figures show that by putting a levy on all people's bills, including the fuel poor, you push more people into poverty than you're able to pull out with the money you're getting from the Say eco. The so you need to... That's just simply not it, true. It's for your own figures. And all what you should be doing... people who've got boilers and insulation under affordable warmth, that's scandalous. It, what that's is scandalous, scandalous is 80% drop in insulation measures you under your government, you. Ed Davey. Yeah. That is what I'll is scandalous. I'll take the people in your constituency who benefited. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> it's astonishing. I can't believe you admit 
have that. There must be, I, I'll get you the figures for your own constituency of all the people figures. who've benefited from the affordable warmth the scheme I'm and the carbon savings. Okay. Okay. It's not true. Thank you very well, much. Well, 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 there's been much, much worse. The numbers have fallen. You let the big six off the hook. Simply not true. Thank you. I'd like to see if there has been any change in the room's feeling about. <laughs> Strikes me you've got a little bit of work to do in the next four or five weeks, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to the panel and thank you again. <laughs>